So yes, we are the Medical Student Council. We are so appreciative that we uh, can host this concluding session to your week-long virtual intro. We hope you had a great time. Um, I did the, the sessions a few years ago and it was such a good educational opportunity. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed the time. So today we have a wonderful group of panelists. Um, they're all physiatrists in many career stages and subspecialties. We are so grateful to them that they are able to be here to share their knowledge and uh, talk about their paths into physiatry and into through their training and into their careers now. So just to start, if the students could, if they haven't done it already, if they could change their Zoom name to be their name, their class year and their institution, that would be wonderful. Um, and in terms of questions, they, you guys are able to ask questions in the chat at any point, and then we'll be able to um, use breaks within our questions that, that we polled you guys about and address them during those breaks between questions. So post them whenever you want in the chat. So to start, um, if the Medical Student Council can start by introducing themselves, I, I can start, I'm Colette Piasecki Masters. I am a fourth year at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Um, I am the education and well-being representative for the AAP Medical Student Council. Is Lydia on the call? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Lydia. I'm the second year at Penn State College of Medicine and I'm also on the education and well-being subcommittee with Colette. Jackie? So I'm Jackie. Hi, everyone. I'm a fourth year here in New Orleans at LSU Medical School. Um, was I supposed to say anything else? Just sorry. Yeah, you're, did you say you're the, what representative? Oh, yes, and I am the mentorship representative. Sorry, fresh off of rounds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Lauren. Hey, I'm Lauren. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Minnesota, and I'm also on the mentorship subcommittee. Valerie. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Valerie Bracier. I'm a third year medical student at Albany Medical College, and I am the new diversity representative on the Medical Student Council. And Victoria. Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm a fourth year med student at University of Texas Medical Branch. Shoot. No, it's, it cut out again. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Gibbs. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. You too. Thanks for being here. Oh, happy to participate. Okay, so Victoria, yep, fourth year medical student, University of Texas Medical Branch on the mentorship committee with Lauren and Jackie. So we are part of the Medical Student Council um, and we are happy to host this panel. So next up, uh, the panelists, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, we would love to hear about uh, where you went to medical school residency and if you've trained in a subspecialty. Um, and if you wanted to, you can add a little fun fact, fun fact at the end to get to know you a little bit better. Um, Dr. Kasi, do you mind starting? Sure. Sorry, my mute wasn't unmuting. Um, so I'm uh, Dr. Ravi Kasi. I currently work at Rush. I'm the program director here. I went to undergrad and med school at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And then I went to uh, residency at Rush, which is here in Chicago. It's literally like two blocks away from each other. And then I've worked here at Rush ever since. So my threats to leave are gonna be empty threats since I haven't left here in 25 years. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm here. And then I forgot the last thing I was supposed to say. What was the, uh, the last question? Fun facts, no if you want, no pressure. <laughs> oh, fun facts. I like Legos, which is like a child thing that I like to do. <laughs> so I share that with a lot of the younger nieces and nephews that I have, so. 
Great, that is a fun fact. Thank you, Dr. Kasi. Um, Dr. Nicole Diaz Sagara, did I say your name correctly? Oh no, we, I can't hear you. Is that just me? I can't hear either, uh, Colette. Okay. Sure, yeah, take your time. So while, while we figure that out, <laughs> no problem. While we figure that out, um, Dr. Moni, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's uh, Lindsay Moni. I'm an assistant professor at University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences right now. I um, went to med school at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Bradenton campus, and then I did residency here at UAMS, and I did fellowship in TBI and polytrauma at uh, the VA in San Antonio. And then what, fun fact about myself, I think. Um, I have a wine reiner. He's crazy. And he wears a bow tie. Oh my gosh. How old is he? Um, five, oh, just turned five. Oh my gosh. What's his name? Leopold. Leopold. That's the <laughs> Love it. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, Dr. Myling, could you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Um, my name is James Myling. Um, I am a current fourth year resident at Mayo Clinic. Um, I did my medical school though at University of North Texas Health Science Center um, or Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's a long name. Um, and then I did my intern year down in rural Texas at Medical City Weatherford in Weatherford, Texas. And then um, I will actually be, I'm the incoming fellow at Wake Forest for the Neuromuscular Medicine Fellowship there. Um, and then my fun fact, uh, I speak Czech, which most people don't speak and can't test me on, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> I'm Czech too. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> My grandma speaks it, but nobody else even attempted. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. So, Dr. Gibbs. Hi, I'm Katie Gibbs. I um, did my med school at New York College of Osteopathic Medicine, which I think is called NYITCOM now. Um, lots of the training that I did has name changes, so hopefully I'm up to date with everything. Um, and then residency was at the Hofstra Northwell program in Long Island. Um, and then I did a fellowship in spinal cord injury medicine at Kessler Rehab in New Jersey. And then I'm currently working um, at the Syracuse VA and at the SUNY Upstate, um, like we're joined together. So doing spinal cord injury medicine. Um, fun fact, I have a Vishla, which is similar to Dr. Moni's dog, but red version, kind of. Um, also lots of energy and craziness. Um, and he's a little over a year and his name is Dalton. So I'm slightly obsessed with him. Thank you for sharing. I have the wonderful ability to go bug Dr. Gibbs at the VA. <laughs> so I'm appreciative of your time. Um, and then Dr. Katz. Sure. I'm Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I went to med school at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. My intern year was at Mount Auburn, which is in Cambridge, the small community hospital um, with Harvard Medical School. And I'm a second year resident at Spalding Rehab. As far as a fun fact, I'll keep the theme going. So I also have a dog. He Yay! loves to make Zoom appearances. He loves Zoom. I'm trying to keep him out of it, but you might see him like pop over my shoulder. So that's what the little furry thing is if you see anything. I always love when we get those features in Zooms, like makes my dog. So I hope so. <laughs> All right. And Dr. Diaz Sagara. Can, can you, you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. I changed to my phone. So I'm Nicole Niasagara. Hi, everyone. I went to medical school in South Jersey at uh, Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. I uh, did my training at Kessler for PMNR, stayed there to do my brain injury fellowship. And I'm currently working in Schenectady, New York, so it's right outside of Albany at Sunnyview Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, managing their brain injury unit. And oh, fun fact, I also have a new dog. So I have three. I have a little Chihuahua mix. I have a pit bull Jack Russell, and then I have a new puppy who's a five month old German Shepherd that I adopted two weeks ago. And I have the bite marks to prove it. <laughs> Busy house, sounds like. I also got um, 
a referral from one of your, you referred one of your patients to Upstate recently. So I was happy to see your name. Thank you all for sharing. Um, so also lastly, for the panelists who haven't met Amy before, Amy, would you introduce yourself for us, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amy. I am at the AAP. And um, yeah, that's I'm the one that sends all the emails. That's usually how I introduce myself. Uh, and people know me because they get all of my my various emails throughout the, the year. So um, it's great to have all of you here and to uh, virtually meet everybody. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, so to get started and remember for the attendees, thank you for coming. You can post your questions in the chat at any point and then we will be able to answer them um, after we take breaks during set question sessions. So to start, we're gonna focus on questions about starting in medical school. Um, so how, for the panelists, how did you get involved in the field during medical school? And please feel free to type answers or answer them um, out loud in any order. I can start. So <clears throat> one of the things that I did back in Texas was there was a um, organization called Rise Adaptive Sports, which was an adaptive sports organization um, that was mostly kids, although there were some adults as well, that we participated with um, a variety of wheelchair sports. Um, so the big one was wheelchair MX, um, so like BMX, but with wheelchairs. Um, and uh, there was also quadriplegic rug rugby and a couple other things as well, but those were kind of the two big ones. And as medical students, we um, helped out at those sessions. We um, would either help get people up ramps, literally pushing um, the, the wheelchair up the ramps, or we would, um, for some of the littler kids, we would actually take them up or down with kind of a, a handle on top of the, the specialized wheelchairs that they were using for this. Um, and so it was a really, it was a cool opportunity to be able to meet a lot of these different kids, learn about how wheelchairs work, learn how to switch out wheels and, and all that kind of stuff to make sure that um, that they were using ones appropriate for their size. And so it was a really good introduction to PM&R. And that was just one of, one of the things that stuck out. I can jump in. Um, so my medical student PM&R experience, largely AAP. So I will support everything that you are saying about how wonderful AAP is. Uh, and my medical school didn't have an interest group when I got there. There was a department and a program and a lot of integration, but not a formal um, interest group. And so one of the things I did was set that up to formalize that relationship between the medical school and the PM&R department, uh, which gives a lot more opportunities as well to have interest group events and to create more um, opportunities for research as well as just experience. Um, so I know that the AP also has some guidance for people looking to create interest groups. So if that's of interest, I use that resource myself. It was very helpful. Another thing was to reach out to other people, similarly medical students who are interested in PM&R throughout the world. And so uh, AP does a great job connecting you with the conferences and social media, um, your journal clubs, I know are a really big thing. And so I think uh, for me, it was a lot of like local aspect of trying to see how I can find my PM&R community within my medical school, but then also reaching out a little bit broader and finding those larger networks to really see what people are doing across the world and how you can build your own um, really experience. I'll say um, for me, for med school, I kind of found PM&R late um, and I, so, so unfortunately I didn't have, like, I don't think that we had an interest group at the time. And so for me, it was mostly doing some like self-exploration. I liked all of my rotations as third and fourth years. And I knew that I liked, um, like musculoskeletal type things. And so I think I was trying to like hone in on different types of rotations to do. I liked orthopedics, um, which doing rotations was great to learn, but I knew like the surgery aspect wasn't for me. And, um, and then I liked neurology as well. And so I think for me doing some different rotations and then talking to um, other people in medicine and they were kind of like, hey, 
did you ever hear about PM&R? And then I explored it a little bit more. And when I did like my first rotation in it, I was like, oh my God, this is what I was looking for. So, um, so it's also okay to not know exactly what you want to do in the beginning. I mean, you guys are already starting out early, which is great. Um, but if, uh, I'm an example of someone who found PM&R late and still ended up being in the field and successful. Um, so it's also uh, okay to be to go that route. I can kind of piggyback off of that. That's almost exactly my story as well. PM&R didn't have a giant focus at my um, medical school. I had heard about it, but I didn't think it was something that I'd be interested in doing, but same thing. I really liked the ortho stuff, didn't so much like the surgery aspect of it, really liked neuro, but didn't feel like I was helping people. I felt like we were more just diagnostic, they were just more diagnosticians and like not doing anything to make people better. And so it was actually a um, family medicine, sports medicine guy that was, you know, listening to what I was interested in and all that. And he was like, it really sounds like you'd like PM&R. And so I looked at doing a, an away rotation my fourth year, did it and just fell in love. Um, and so I liked everything about it. It wasn't one of those specialties where I was like, I like this, but not that. Um, and so I just kind of went with it after that. I had a very similar experience too, but I think to a little bit more of a late degree. So I was doing a completely different specialty up until I had to do a mandatory uh, rotation and one of like, it was four different rotations you could choose from and one of which was PM&R. And my husband's a, a physical therapist. So he had said, why don't you do PM&R, see if you like it. So I did it and I loved it. But unfortunately it was November into December of my fourth year of medical school and I already applied to a different specialty. So I last minute pulled out of the other specialty and applied to PM&R and I just never looked back. It was the best decision of my life. And one of the big things that I loved was the consult side and the brain injury side, which is obviously why I'm a brain injury doctor. However, the other aspects of PMR were also interesting and I loved how the focus was function. And that was really, so I was very late to the game and I ended up matching, but very, very late, December of my fourth year. <laughs> I think, uh, I think for me, um, you know, everyone's got a similar story. I think back, you know, I say back in the day, cause I feel like an old man, but um, we were all late to the game cause the field wasn't as popular. Um, I think the key for me, um, it, I had similar experiences as everyone else, was finding a mentor uh, and a mentor that I really liked and I identified with. So when I did my, uh, as a third year uh, med student on my post-call days in internal medicine, I would just walk over from UIC to Rush, which is, you know, like I said, two blocks away. And um, I met my, the former chair here, Dr. Young, and uh, he was just, you know, I was like, man, I want to do everything you're doing. And so for me, that was, it was not necessarily experiencing things, but just meeting the people in the field. And then really saying it solidified my want to uh, to go into this field. I was just lucky enough to continue to work and he was able to mentor me for many years. So um, if there's anything that I would say is that try to find a mentor, which is so hard. I know if, if you got, you know, if you had one, you would have one. It's, it's hard. But if you can, that, that might be the, the missing piece to really solidify what you really want to do, you know. I see Dr. Myling said he did a ton of sports coverage at high school football games, Special Olympics, college wheelchair basketball, USA judo, wrestling, volleyball coverage. That sounds really fun. Just to kind of go off of what Dr. Kazi was saying, um, they, uh, AAP does have a mentorship program as well <clears throat> that medical students could get paired up with residents or, or fellows or attendings. Um, and uh, that is, I mean, I found that really beneficial being on the mentor side, mentoring multiple medical students. Um, so if you can't find anyone close by you, um, wherever you're at for school, like doing it through AAP has been, I think, a fun experience to do and gotten to do it with quite a few people. So um, there's always people out there willing to, to help out. Agreed. I have a wonderful mentor through that same resource. And we also now, to plug AAP's uh, Big Buddy program, we also have that. So if you haven't signed up, you should sign up for AAP's Big Buddy program. You'll get matched with um, a medical student who can also help with mentorship. Okay.
Thank you all for that. We'll go on to the next question. All right, so next question is what core rotations or fourth year electives were beneficial for PM&R for students to participate in? I'm pretty close to this, so I can jump in. Um, I think there's going to be a standard list that you'll see if you Google it. So you'll have rheumatology, neurology, orthopedics, family medicine, and I support all of that. The one thing I will say is as a fourth year medical student, it's your last chance to really see almost anything. But after that, you go into your either your TI program or your intern year um, and you start to really specialize. And so every specialty has some way of impacting PM&R. Your patients are going to come from another specialty in some way, have some consultant on their team. Um, and so I think it's also really important to have a broad experience. And within anything you do, you're going to find that PM&R connection. Um, some of them are more overt than others. And so I think as a fourth year medical student, yes, take the ones that have a clear connection to PM&R, the neurology, rheumatology, orthopedics, early medicine. Um, but if there's one that's really interesting to you, I would also say take the opportunity as a fourth year medical student to do it. And with your PM&R interest, put that lens on it and see what you can get out of it in that way. Because there's so many different things in PM&R that you'll see um, that relate in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And if you don't put yourself out there to see how you can connect all of your interests, you won't get there. And so um, definitely do the core ones that you know, you'll know you see everywhere, but I really encourage everyone also to, if you have an interest, follow that. This is the part of medicine that's fun when you're a fourth year and you get to really do what you want. So please also take that opportunity. I ended up doing a lot of rotations as electives besides my, my PM&R um, elective rotation I did during my third year and then a couple sub eyes that I did. Um, I ended up doing a lot of ones that were like PM&R adjacent. Um, and so I did like an interventional pain um, rotation. I did a rheumatology and neurology. I did a urology rotation um, just to see, because I knew that we were getting patients um, from PM&R. We at, at PM&R, we'd get patients from all those fields or we'd refer out to some of those fields. And so it was nice to kind of know who was coming in from where and where they'd be sent to afterwards and know what happens in that standpoint. Um, and so it was, I, I thought that was beneficial to at least begin to understand what other fields can do and help out with the similar patient population. My, um, <clears throat> my advice is as a third year and as a fourth year, and particularly as a fourth year after you've matched and after you've high-fived everybody and partied, you're like, oh my God, I'm going to be a resident. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, or um, I'm going to be PMR. Like, I need to get really focused. But, you know, whoever, and I'm sorry, I was doing two things at once, but whoever the first person who was speaking was talking about, you know, you should probably enjoy the process because there's not enough rotations and not enough time to do all the things that you think you need to do. And you think you need to do absolutely everything. So trust your interests because whatever you do, you'll carry it on forever. You know, there are things in my ENT rotation that I did as a med student that I carried through this day. There are things in my GI rotation that I did as a PGY1 that I carry to this day because I chose to be participatory and, and pay attention. Now remember, it's a, such a crapshoot because you could be a PGY4 who's super motivated, but you're on a team with a, with a team that doesn't really engage with medical students. So did it matter that you did this palm rotation? No, right? And so really just do the things that you enjoy because no matter what you do to prepare, you won't be prepared, but that's why you have a residency. And then even during your residency, there's not enough rotations to do to prepare you for your career. So it's just, it's never ending. So just be happy and enjoy the process and the journey and whatever opportunities come your way. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. I completely agree. And, you know, talking with med students, I also recommend while they're on their rotations is, really take the time to um, learn whatever specialty you are and pick up the things that are important to them too. So like history taking things and physical exam things, because you're going to get so bogged down, especially just intern year, you have honestly no idea what you're doing. And then even when you're a PGY2 and PM&R, you kind of have no idea what you're doing because it's like intern year all over again. And so really, you know, history and physical exam are like the most important things because if you don't take a good history, you don't have a good physical exam, it's really hard to do all the other stuff. And so really getting what's important for them in history and physical exam and fine tuning those skills while you're still a med student, you have time to really sit down and think about all of that is super, super important. 
agree with everything that was said. The only thing I really want to add were two rotations that I found really beneficial were psychiatry and trauma surgery, because there's so much overlay between both of those and PM&R in general. So I thought those were two very, very valuable rotations during my third and fourth year. I agree with what everyone has said. I have nothing else to add. You all did a wonderful job. <laughs> All right, Victoria, you want to read the next question? Yes. So what challenges or obstacles did you guys face in medical school? Um, I can start. At, so um, this is, well, I guess this would be in medical school. So I applied to PMNR. As I said, I found PMNR um, late. And so initially I first applied and I didn't match, which at the time was devastating. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I finally found the specialty that I want to do and I didn't match because things were becoming more competitive at the time and I think since then um, things have gotten even more competitive for you guys um, and so I had matched for my intern year and during that year I took um, time to really figure out like if I wanted to reapply for PMNR or um, did I want to try to figure out if there was a way that I could do what I wanted to do through a different specialty. Like if um, initially I thought that I liked um, like sports medicine type stuff. And so another route to that is through family medicine. Um, and so was that something that I wanted, uh, would I be okay trying to go that route instead? Um, and then I decided that I really, really wanted to do PM&R. Um, and so I did apply again and matched. And then during like, so I ended up having a gap year. Um, and I did, uh, I found a PM&R research position that happened to be paid, which was great. Um, and then that has like looking back at things, um, like I said, horrible, I just, it, I know you guys probably all feel the same way. Like at the time you're going through it and it's just like horrible. Um, but then it really, um, for my career, it took the, the path it was supposed to. And like that research year that I had only helped me further, like to get the fellowship that I wanted. And the fellowship that I had helped me get the job that, um, that I have now. And so I think that everything worked out the way um, that it was supposed to um, so far. And so uh, I know that oftentimes in medicine, we all have like different paths as to like what brings us into medicine. And it's not always like a clear, um, a, a straight path, right? And so just know that there are ways um, to get what you want, uh, even if your path takes some turns along the way. Um, and so hopefully everything, if you really want, if you know what you want and you keep working hard for it, I think that um, whatever challenges come up, hopefully you can overcome. Um. I'm happy to give a quick thing, you know, obstacles wise. I think um, I think the key here, and this is what I learned early in med school, was that everyone's going through their own obstacles. It's just that some of us choose to be more vocal about it. I was very vocal um, when I was in med school, when I didn't do well in classes or I failed a class, because I was had my own uh, attitude problems of what I thought effort was in terms of being able to study and pass the test. And I didn't realize that other people were struggling and I thought I was the only one going through it. And then lo and behold, I'm coming to the summer remediation. And then I look over and I'm like, hey, I know you, I know you, you guys are telling me everything is so easy, right? And so just know that you're not the only one that's struggling. Um, and then the, the second part, you know, in terms of the obstacle, 
is, um, you know, for me, I needed an attitude adjustment because I thought everything was going to come easy to me as it did in high school and undergrad because I got away with murder. And then med school was a toast of re or was a taste of reality. And so during that period of time, you know, my major obstacle was within myself in terms of my own anxiety, my own being down on myself. And then, of course, I didn't feel at that time my med school supported me. And that uh, remains a debate. I don't want to say it's anything wrong with the med school. A lot of it has to do with me. But the key here to me was framing things in a positive way, because I went to a dean who told me, yep, you're going to match into rural family medicine programs, which was to me devastating because I was like, I want to do PMR. And this other guy goes, well, everything does not look great, but if you're really interested in it, you should go for it. And I'm truncating what he said, but he said it in such a positive, he said the same thing in a very positive way and said, if you want to go for it, go for it. And I said, you know what, I'm going to grab that little piece of hope and I'm going to go for it. And it worked out for me. And so whenever I talk to a med student, it's always going to be something about why everything is negative and bad about their application and scores or whatever. And I would tell them the same thing. Who gives a crap? You got to go for it if that's what you're interested in. And the key here is this. Any type of adversity that you go through, that obstacle is going to make you stronger. And it's going to make you better because you're going to become very creative on how to troubleshoot different problems. So for me as a program director, do I want to take someone who's never had any obstacles in their in their path, or that's the way that they frame it, everything came easy? Probably not, because then it's going to be my job to kind of hold their hand through all these problems versus someone else that says, I've had all these 10 problems, but I got through it. I'm getting better every day. I don't have to do anything for this person from a wellness perspective, mental health perspective, because they already have come in tune with who they are. So if you've got obstacles and you overcame it, just know you're you're an amazing candidate. So the more the more obstacles, the better, I guess. But I, I say that tongue in cheek. But hopefully my message can. For me, one of the biggest obstacles I was the first year that had the virtual um, interview season for residency because of COVID. I think that's probably a lot of what uh, people have on their minds as well with this. Um, and that was a huge stressor for me because we didn't know what that was going to look like. Uh, if you get a sense of the program and I really enjoyed it. And I think most importantly is I did feel like you could actually get a sense of the programs, especially with everything on social media, people have really read on their websites. They have Instagrams, Twitters, you can get a sense of the feel. Uh, the biggest thing that I said was most helpful was to reach out to residents at those programs, do a little bit more offline. You can't have those side conversations during a residency interview. It doesn't work the same way on Zoom. Um, so if you want to get a more of a feel, I think reaching out to people, I'm happy if you're interested in Spalding, you can reach out to me, um, but find people on Twitter, on Instagram, anyone who's at those um, like pre-interview Zoom dinners, I think we're still calling them that, um, usually they'll give you your contact information. So that was a huge stressor on my end of how I would get to know where I wanted to go if I couldn't actually be there. Uh, but I think you can get creative and I think programs have an excellent job. And so if that's a concern, I hope people... Um, a little bit better after you can talk to me or other people who've gone through it and it does work virtually I think very well. Okay, next question, Lauren. Yes, next question here is, what is something you wish you knew prior to starting residency? I can jump in. Um, probably close to this as well. Uh, so uh, before intern year, I'll start with that. Uh, like what Dr. Kasi said, you are not going to be prepared. It doesn't matter what you do. And that's not a reflection on you. I think that's really important to remember. Um, you can study as much as you want, but there's nothing you can do to prepare for being an intern except for being an intern. Um, and I am about a month into residency. And so far, it seems the same for that. Um, you can have your wonderful resources and you should try and learn as much as you can outside of your clinical time. Um, but just being there and learning and asking questions is the most important thing. 
Um, going back one more to the intern year, because I've gotten this question a lot, which is if you should study a lot before you start. Um, and the advice I got was only if you needed to feel confident is to do that. And that's what I, so I did a little bit, um, but take the time to enjoy yourself. I think refreshing yourself is the best thing you can do to prepare for the marathon um, that is intern year. And I guess maybe a little residency too. I'll defer to others in this call to talk more about residency. Um, but yes, I would say just work on yourself as opposed to your knowledge, and then you'll be able to support yourself through the hard times. One thing I wish I knew before starting was this, that you don't have to have your whole career figured out the day before residency starts. Um, I came into residency thinking I'm going to do sports medicine. And then I realized I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and, then, and then I continued on. And I actually, um, I'm a little unique in my program that I, I think I'm the only one who's actually applied to three different types of fellowships. Because um, I actually, I applied to pain and to interventional spine, both through ACGMA and through NAS. Um, and then as I was going through that, I, I had some personal goals that I figured out that I wanted to do differently. And, and I also had also just finished my, my six months of EMG that we do here at, at Mayo. And, and I realized at that time that I, man, I loved EMG <laughs> and, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to have that get cut down at all by doing, by doing something else that would take more of my time. And so I made us, I made another switch um, and ended up actually, I'm doing neuromuscular now. Um, and so, but no one, no one holds you to that first day of residency when they ask you like, so what are you going to do? Like, you, you're allowed to change. <laughs> you're allowed to, um, as you do your rotations and as you figure out what you like on each of the rotations you're doing, you can take bits and pieces of that to create your practice and, and what you're actually going to do in the long run. But uh, you'll, you'll figure it out. Everyone figures it out along the way. And some people figure it out that first year. Some people figure it out at the end of their fourth year or, or past that. So don't worry if you don't have it all figured out right now. I, I can go next. I, I agree with what everybody has said. I too changed my mind in the middle of residency and realized that I didn't like what I was going to do. I thought I was also going to do MSK. I don't like really outpatient and MSK wasn't super fun for me. So that was a terrible idea on my part. Um, but yeah, not knowing or being prepared to not know everything um, because, you know, kind of it's been kind of said throughout this whole thing. But, you know, a lot of us are overachievers, if not all of us. And we did really well, a lot of us in high school and college and then med school. Maybe it was a little bit harder, but for some people, it's pretty easy to then you get to intern year. And you think you know, but like, I even remember, I think my first order was potassium supplementation. And I just remember sitting there, like not wanting to sign the order. Cause I was like, oh my God, they're going to go into cardiac arrhythmia and it's going to be the worst thing ever. And I'm going to be the reason it was like 20 mil equivalents. It was nothing, but you know, you just think about all that kind of stuff. And then, like I said before, it happens again, second year. And everyone's always a little disappointed because they're like, yeah, I get to do PM and R now. And then they get to it and they realize, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing still. And then it happens again when you get your first attending job and you're like, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and so, it, I mean, it happens over and over, but knowing that everybody else is in the same position as you, but also that you've made these connections that you can reach out to and there's people that can help you. Nobody knows everything. I'm constantly looking stuff up and looking for new articles and even just to solidify my like basic medical knowledge, I'm constantly looking things up because I'll get it mixed up in my head or I'll start doubting myself or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody does it. A lot of times you just don't see people doing it or see people doubting themselves. So it looks like everything has everything, to, everybody has everything together, but that's definitely not the case. I think going off of what, um, I think everyone has said so far, I think uh, I would summarize my thoughts in saying just like being open-minded going into residency, because um, as 
everyone is saying, um, we all thought that we wanted to do one thing and then uh, learning that maybe we wanted to change our mind. Um, it's also okay to go in and knowing what you want to do and sticking with that too. Um, but I think that just making sure that you um, ask lots of questions and learn as much as you can on those other rotations, um, like say that you want to do sports and spine, um, but still be an active participant in your inpatient rotations, right? And um, because I think that that's the type of stuff that you will, um, that will just continue to help you because you're, you're gonna see all of these patients uh, if you're not caring for them on the inpatient side of things, then they'll probably come to you as an outpatient, right? Um, and so it's just keeping an open mind and working hard on all of your rotations. Um, and I will say my first order that I wrote that I was so nervous about was for Tylenol. So, um, so know that we all feel that way when you first start intern year. And, um, and then the same thing happened to me as I transitioned to an, an attending and I was like, oh my God, there's no one here to check what I wrote. Is this going to be okay? I'm signing this, um, which is exciting and, but also very nerve wracking. And so know that we all go through that. And the only thing, I mean, I echo what everyone's been saying, but the only thing I have to really add is something that I tried to take with me throughout medical school with intern year, residency, fellowship, and as an attending is being comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's okay to say, I don't know. And that's where so many amazing ideas and thoughts, research projects, and good patient care comes from because it challenges you to constantly learn because it is it is the art of medicine. So I love when I don't, a patient asks me a question or a family member asks me a question that I don't know the answer to. I say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And that's why I constantly love being challenged and learning. So just be uncomfortable, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's probably some of my best advice. Thank you all so much for your input. This is really valuable information for us all. Um, we have a lot of questions in the chat um, to start. Uh, Natalia asked if there's any advice for IMG students, um, and uh, I don't know, Natalia, did you did you have a specific question about IMG students, or um, just you're asking just in general? Okay. Well, um, we can go down to the next question. It says, you had mentioned that starting a student interest group to make yourself a competitive applicant. I have been hearing that doing research would make you more competitive candidate than starting a club. How accurate is this? How can I make myself the most competitive candidate as an IMG? So I guess I'll try to answer this and I'm not a program director, um, but I think that one of the most important things for candidacy is just showing an interest in PM&R and having things on your CV that are in line with PM&R. Um, and so, you know, it, it's easy to see when people are really excited about certain specialties and really have an interest in certain specialties. And so um, doing anything you can, you know, some med schools really have the research thing picked out and people are paired with a mentor and they do it and that's what they do in med school. Others don't. And like when I was in med school, I had no opportunities to do research or anything like that. And so that just wasn't something that was I was able to get, but I did other things like volunteer and, you know, um, I think somebody else was talking about how they did um, different things with like uh, kids with disabilities and that kind of stuff and just getting yourself out there and doing that, knowing that not everybody has the same, you know, and I was in Florida and then I also, my fourth year was everywhere. And so I wasn't even somewhere where I could do something for a very long time. And so just doing anything you can to show interest and in anything that um, shows that you're trying to do as much as you can 
um, having research isn't the end all be all of anything. Um, starting a club isn't the end all be all of everything. It's really about the whole picture that you're presenting and that you're trying to show interest and in showing that you really have a passion for this. If I can add on from the, the research standpoint, one of the things I did in medical school is that I looked for case reports because case reports are not, um, they're not super time intensive as compared to some of the other things you can do, but you can do those to, on really any rotation. Um, and you can make, you can find things that are PMNR related. For example, I was on an outpatient pediatrics rotation and we had a patient come in and um, one thing led to another and she ended up getting diagnosed with pediatric MS. And so something is some rotation that I didn't think that was going to be related to, to PM&R very much. I was able to find something that could be re more related to PM&R. Um, and so you can kind of look on the rotations that you're on, see if that's, if you can find a case that you're, um, that might be interesting. You can ask your attending um, if that's something that they think might be interesting. And then trying to, trying to submit it to something like a PM&R or AAP or AOC PM&R, any of these PM&R organizations to present it um, is a, is a little less time intensive way you can try and <laughs> try and do it. I think, um, again, I'm not a program director either, but I think that one of the things that can help you to stand out, like you both were saying already, is just showing interest. And so showing interest in extracurriculars, regardless of what that is, uh, volunteer research experience, um, and then showing interest on really showing interest on your rotations. Um, and because then that in turn will give you good letters of recommendation. And um, I think that all of us as attendings or soon to be attendings or fellows um, would say that we love when students are interested and it makes it so much fun um, to have a student that's interested and asking questions and, and engaging with the patients. Um, and so I think that uh, clinically, if you can find a way to um, make yourself stand out as well, then um, that will just help to complete the successful package. I agree with what everyone said as usual, but um, the one thing I would like to add is that you have to be passionate and love whatever you're doing. It's These things are going to come up on your interviews and it's really going to show if it's if you're doing a research project just because you're checking a box you're starting an interest group just because you're checking a box so i think whatever you decide to do jump into it love it be passionate about it and it'll shine through in the end thank you all so much for this advice um, our next question in the chat is, can you share your thoughts on the potentially new match process proposed by the NRMP, which is having an earlier match in February, and how having that earlier match day should affect how we approach third and fourth year? So I don't know anything about that. Can you guys give us more information? Or if I'm the only one that doesn't know about it, um, I don't. feel free. Okay. So can you tell us what's going on? I, I, I can try just from what I've read, um, but they're proposing like this two phase uh, match process starting for uh, specifically the class of 2024. Um, and only from what I've read, so I kind of wanted to ask the pros, you guys, um, your thoughts and opinion on it, if you have heard anything. I believe it's a match process where you'd match in February. And then from what I've heard, correct me if I'm wrong, they'd get away with the uh, the original SOAP process that was happening before and have like a second match in March. Um, but I, that's all I've heard. So then I guess that that sounds more organized it, rather than the soap, uh, possibly. 
I don't know. Cause I think like, so the, with the soap, the, it was like the scramble, right? And so then you had to contact, pay, you had to see what programs had, um, see what programs had unmatched spots and contact them. And then they could kind of, um, it was like an agreement that way that you could find an open spot. If they liked you, you were the first one or to interview with them then, and, and they liked you too, you could fill that spot. Um, so it sounds like the NRMP is taking a little bit more control possibly and organizing things. Um, I don't know, it, yeah, I don't know if that's plus or minus. Maybe less work on the applicants and the, because you have someone overseeing everything. I guess with like, with the earlier match in February, that first match, um, would you guys recommend maybe like doing your audition rotations earlier? Um, I guess in general, just having your materials ready earlier? I think if the idea is to have the um, uh, initial match just moved up, then I would treat it the same way than we've been treating the current match, the, I guess the only one right now, um, where you would have all of your materials and you would do your interpretations ahead of time uh, so that if you were matching, I think my answer is everyone would go for the first match. And then if you needed to, you do the second one as well. And so the goal is to be as competitive as possible for the first one is my understanding. Uh, and so I would treat the first one like the only one. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't match the first time, then you have the second one to be a more organized uh, soap is what I've understood it to be. So yes, I would treat the first one like the true match. Um, do everything you can to set up for success, get all your traditions, get everything done. Um, but I also want to just point out that from what I understand, this is very much a tentative question to the public. It is not, we are doing this, what are your thoughts about it? So I don't know that this is actually going to happen, or if it does, that it'll be for the first class 2024. So um, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more as people raise more questions. Thank you. Okay, should I move on to the next one, Colette? Cool. So the next question in the chat is, any advice on not being able to do an obey rotation in the region you want to do residency in? And then follow-up is, how can we show interest in the region in addition to family ties? The, um, I think the, one of the newer things that came out was um, you're able to do a regional preference. You're also able to do tokens as well. So um, just look it up on the match website. They do a really great job of explaining it. Um, so you have up to three regions. I think it's based off of some sort of geographical thing from a mail system. So there's nine, I think. And so you can pick up to three or have no geographical preference. So if you lived in New York all your life, but you want to move to Denver, Colorado, you can put that in their geographical preference. Um, and then of course, in your personal statement, when you give, um, if you're able to do that special paragraph that some programs ask for, you can be like, listen, I have a geographical preference, which I put down. Um, and so in the olden days, I agree, we always worry, like if you lived all your life in one location, why do you want to come here all of a sudden? And this kind of uh, solves that. You can double down on it. So if you really like that Denver program, I'm just saying that because the program is really great. Um, you, can, um, uh, you can also give a token as well. So you have up to four tokens and um, you can put the token down and the geographical preference. So you're basically telling the program, not only do I like the region, but you're my top four on the, the before we even begin the process. So. Yeah, in addition to that, that supplemental and RMP thing, um, also a lot of the programs are doing um, these little like meet and greet kind of things um, for each program. And so you can go to those um, and express your interest, talk to the residents. Um, sometimes there's attendings that attend them. Um, people are also, we're also doing a lot of um, things at like AAP and R, AAP um, and that kind of stuff um, where you can, they're doing like 
residency panels and like different residency programs will go and you have the opportunity to ask questions and all that. And so definitely doing that kind of stuff to express your interest um, and show interest in programs is a way to do it too. Amazing. Well, for the sake of time, to respect everyone's time, um, we this will be the um, concluding question. Um, we we really appreciate all of your your knowledge and um, insights and sharing so vulnerably your uh, challenges throughout your training. Um, I, so in terms of future questions, all of our contact information is on the website that Amy has sent out to you. Um, she has put our emails, our you know, social media, anything that, you, you know, for attendees, if you have questions, please reach out. Um, we're all here to support you um, in your journey. A uh, huge thank you to Amy for helping set this up. Um, it's been wonderful. Thank you for having us host the concluding session. We hope the attendees got a lot of benefit from hearing from the panelists. Uh, thank you to Lydia, Jackie, Valerie, Victoria. Um, you know, everyone has been awesome. Huge help, um, Lauren. And thank you to our panelists, most of all. Uh, you know, you, you have really been such a great source of information. And thank you so much for being here today. Um, just a reminder to you, last reminder, it, this will be shared on AAP's YouTube channel. Um, so once it's uploaded, you'll be able to view it and share it after the fact. So thank you all so much for coming. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening.